when we started this year, it looked pretty hazy. But one good thing seemed to come out of 1st Jan 2022, and that was the kickoff of RCEP, the biggest trade deal in the world. It came with a promise of creating more than 2 million jobs and a never before opening up of markets in North Asia between China, Japan, and South Korea. But five months on, Minister, do you think RCEP has delivered? This is the biggest uh, trade deal ever. 30% of the populations, 30% of the GDP, 30% of trade, and 30% of foreign direct investment. So in the countries, uh, all of all in all, we're moving forward very good. Uh, Indonesia, uh, maybe with the Philippines, will be the last. Uh, maybe by uh, I'm going to I'm going to see the parliament on a, a 9th of June to have the final process of this. But if you ask me whether this is already going or not, I think it's already kicked off because the ASEAN scheme with this my uh, dialogue partners, you know, we already have you know the ASEAN uh, Australian New Zealand uh, free trade agreement, ASEAN China free trade agreement, ASEAN Japan free trade agreement. So we have these things. You know, the market access basically is already there, but the trade facilitations and making it to be more uh, comprehensive uh, will be done probably second semester of 2022. We're ready, willing, and able to come back to trade, to create prosperity in the region, peaceful and balanced and inclusive. Tak, what do you think? Do you think that RCEP is already beginning to show the benefits that you'd hoped it would? Not yet. I think uh, it's been only five months, and uh, it's already to say good or not. And the uh, key thing is China. Um, the success of uh, our step is dependent on the commitment of China. The reason behind this is, uh, first of all, China is under zero COVID policy. China is the center of the uh, global supply chain, which is a huge bottleneck to the world. And uh, our step will be a huge um, supply chain over the world, and it should be led by China. So what about their commitment? And they will be a huge driving force of uh, our step. But we don't know about that because, to be honest, China is not fully trusted by the members yet. So they have to demonstrate their commitment to RCEP after zero COVID. But I think this is a great opportunity for China to show they are serious about free trade. Is that true? Do you feel that, uh, you know, the other members in RCEP don't trust China? There's a graph given by, by the Dutch Institute of Think Tank. And it shows that uh, because of China, every country in the world is coming back with the global value chain, except China. But because they, they have their own ways on taking, taking care of the economy. But for countries like Indonesia, this is a golden opportunity. You know, we look, we look at the, because of supply chain, we look, for example, the automotive industry in Europe. You know, from before COVID, after COVID, uh, the growth, market growth by 8%. But the supply growth industry, only 3%. This number shows the same thing. You know, we are producing cars. We're beating Thailand right now. So before COVID, we sell about $8.8 .8 billion. You know, it would drop by 20%, but coming back, growth only 2.7%. You know what happened, Sacho, Sama? They're coming back and invest in Indonesia. So I'm very optimistic of this. This is what we call new equilibrium. How come we can, you know, feel optimistic under the current uh, COVID, uh, zero COVID policy of China, because uh, every country has suffered now, and we don't know when the zero COVID uh, will be eased toward the uh, you know, normalcy. You know what? They just announced the trade balance between Indonesia and China. A bit scared. You know why, Professor? Indonesia surplus $1.1 billion with the Chinese. But Indonesia right now, a country that you know, had a trade balance of minus 15 billion for the last, I don't know, 10, 20, 20, uh, 12 years, you know, last year, almost even, today, first quarter, 1.1 billion actually surplus. Professor, what do you think? Do the numbers bear this out? RCEP is, is a meaningful deal. And the ministers already hinted at this. Before RCEP happened or came into force, this region was putting in place non-tariff barriers like there was no tomorrow. In the five years before um, the pandemic, 
nearly 4,000 non-tariff bar barriers were put in place by the RCEP countries. About 40% of the trade between them is covered by those barriers. So there's plenty to try and cut away at or to rationalize, okay? This though will take time. Uh, and you know, trade agreements are a bit like your long-term fitness trainer, right? They, they pay off over time. If you want to flip an answer, is, is, is RCEP working? Quite frankly, it's probably created more jobs in trade ministries than in the private sector by now, okay? But as the private sector's expectations adjust, and this is exactly the comment which I think we heard earlier, then they will then start adjusting, expanding, and this will generate benefits over time. If the World Bank's got the numbers right, this will pull up real wages in, in the RCEP region, and in particular in the sectors which hire a lot of women. So there is an inclusive, inclusive dimension to this well. So I think the region's got to stick with it, and there will be payoffs. Coming back to talk, I would say, if we look at Centauri, after all, people would say that RCEP is going to be incredible, even if it's not immediately now, but in the future. This is a tremendous market for you in China and South Korea. In, exactly. in, in Japan, you've pretty much maxed up what you can do. I was a part of the negotiation for RCEP, and uh, Japan will get uh, lots of benefits because we can export to China quite a lot, and uh, zero tariff item will be increasing over 10 to 20 years. So that should happen. From that perspective, I'm so optimistic. But uh, there, there is a huge headwind led by the United States, which means uh, if China shows it's opening the market, I think uh, they can alleviate the you know, strong headwind from uh, many countries led by US. I think uh, definitely China has to dem demonstrate its commitment within a couple of years after zero COVID. So I think uh, that's the key. And I want to be optimistic because Japan will get a huge benefit and the Santori will get, you know. So we are on the same boat, but uh, what about China? Let's move to the other big sort of elephant in the room for all people now, and that is inflation. The immediate idea, though, is you think, hey, you've got this fantastic trade deal. Is it going to be able to help push down prices so that people won't find it so expensive to buy things? You have recently raised the prices for soft drinks across the board. Yeah, that's right. Um, we have to respond to the current uh, jeopardy of the global supply chain. Though Japanese people are not uh, resilient enough to accept a further price hike, but uh, I think uh, definitely we manufacturers have to pass on to customers to some extent, depending on situation of each country. But I think uh, this uh, uh, supply chain jeopardy will continue. And plus, uh, our yen is weaker and weaker. So, so I I mean, if the IMF's got this right, the reason we're getting inflation in a lot of countries is too much demand chasing too few goods. So one way to fix that is to have more goods coming in abroad. Sourcing from abroad is one option. And secondly, of course, as demand is diverted towards imports, uh, this uh, relieves the pressure on domestic markets. So trade could actually be part of that solution. Now, I'll be frank, trade deals are not the cure for inflation. And trade reform is not going to solve inflation overall, but it can make a positive contribution pulling down the prices of things, some aspects. And as I'm sure our colleague will highlight, the more stable and fluid supply chains are, the more reliable they are, then, of course, that sourcing from abroad will expand. The core of that issue has to do with China and it has to do with the global reaction to transportation dislocation that we've experienced in the last years. But if we get more reliability, and this comes back to the what about China, because once China is active and back to business as usual, RCEP will act a bit as an Asia for Asia, giving shorter, 
more stable supply chains that cushion the region and member states from shocks in the rest of the world like what we're seeing in Europe. Minister, do you agree? Asia for Asia? This is by default because, you know, I think this is also to tell everyone that we have to come back to trade. We have to come back and create a regional, peaceful, inclusive and prosperous region. Indonesia has banned the export of palm oil. That is a security issue, but for many you might call that a protectionist issue as well. I, I hate to say this, okay? That's why I said it depends on who's saying it. You know, when the European, when the Americans, when the developed countries doing it, for example, do you know at one point, back in July, last July, they have, the European owns 3.7 more vaccine than the populations. 3.7 times more. And they call it security. When Indonesia is doing it, that's protectionism. Professor, you actually track <laughs> protectionism stroke security. Is the minister giving a fair uh, review of this? He was comparing vaccines with palm oil. <laughs> I mean, we've tracked both, actually. He's right to say that we have seen export curbs in, in both areas. I think the vaccine export curbs and the curbs on uh, shipping vaccine ingredients to the extent that they happen were very bad public policy um, and something we sh should have avoided. But I think the point to put back to the minister is, look, you know, we've seen how bad vaccine export curbs are. We're now seeing how bad food export curbs are. Don't we need a new global understanding on when these curbs should be used, how long they should be last, how long, and whether or not you know, they should be tracked systematically by the WTO Secretariat, because none of that's happening at the moment. When you said that understanding, who should start first? The developed country or our developing countries? No, this has to be global, right? We're now a global world. We're, I mean, what happens in Indonesia matters in Europe, what happens in Europe matters in so Indonesia. Now, so we have to have everyone yeah, at the So table. Professor, now, yes. the issue is right now, Indonesia is a country in a run. We need to double the GDP before the end of the, of the decades, you know, because we are a middle class. And if we don't do this trajectory of 5.7% every year, we will be trapped in a middle income trap. Okay? I have a set schedule and I need to jump up the value chain every year and I have a set, set up what things. You know, <coughs> COVID didn't help. But right now, you know, my, my biggest, my biggest uh, not, I wouldn't say enemy, but my, my biggest trading partner that does not comply with that called the European Union. If we don't have multilateral trading system, countries like Indonesia cannot be guaranteed that we can be served you know, with a good ruling of multilateral trading system. But at the end of the day, this is national interest. We're feeding our people. So with that, you know, Indonesia would like to come back. You know, if everyone is behaving well, we are going to behave well too. Along with ASEAN countries, we are going to do that. But my agenda with my ASEAN colleagues is set. We have to go up the value chain. Are the developed countries like Japan playing by different rules? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, what lacks uh, RCEP is the uh, kind of strict system to monitor what's happening. And uh, I think uh, the uh, key success factor of uh, RCEP is uh, uh, we should not create uh, big winners. We should not create big losers. Maybe Japan is too good, I mean, too, too big, I mean, benefiting too much. We have to adjust, otherwise we can't keep our ship you know, going forward. So we need a strict I, system. I, I, and, I, I, I totally I'm talking disagree, about yes. enforcement. And somebody has to do it, but we have to work together, such as uh, you know, um, the uh, committee to talk about the what's wrong, what's good, to better off always this system. Trade deals can never be enforcement, Ark. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone would think that a trade deal can actually function if you have to bully <laughs> your, your members into doing what they agreed to do. That is a set of mind misling, okay? This is the problem with development. When somebody's developing, somebody, it's like a reserve, you know, this is like a bottle. The water would go on the, on the, on the development side. Is it a zero-sum so, game? It doesn't no, have to be. It, it, it can be a bigger game. part when, for When everyone. there is a development here, there is a de-development somewhere else. <laughs> okay? So that is why the developed countries would like to say, everyone has to win a little bit. I can't. I can't. You are at $42,000 $42, GDP. I need to double this to 10000 
And this is the matter of national security and the matter of survival. If I don't do this, my democracy fail. I can't do that. So I need to go up the step and I need to do this, Ms. Lin, I have to do two <coughs> things to be not trapped in middle income trap. I need to invest in infrastructure and second is technology transfer. So this is the, this is the, the recipe. So I need to source this technology from somewhere else. If you don't give it to me, if the Japanese didn't give it to me, I have, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm going somewhere else. And that's what we're doing. I think we are giving you lots of aids, you know, over time and that we are trying to work with you quite a lot over yes, years. Yes, 50 years that ago, yes. That creates a trust 50 years ago, between yes. two countries. No, 50 years ago, yes. But today, I don't need your aid. I told the European, they can take away the, 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 uh, the corporate economic partnership agreement that we're talking right now. It's okay, because the division of roles is fine. <laughs> among you know, your country, among the you know, 13 countries, division of roles, that's the you know, destination of this you know, trade deal. Minister, so is the only answer that only when China comes online again uh, in a big way, that's going to, to kickstart RCEP? Why everyone thinks that China is the problem? You know, if China is the problem, it's an opportunity for Indonesia. So we have an inflow of investment. You know, if you look at the rupiah right now, we are very strong. Why? Instead of dollars coming out, actually foreign money is coming in you know, for investment. So, Tuck, we are back to this argument. You keep hacking at China, you you keep focusing on the half empty. But really, it's an opportunity for Japan. Well, we have to keep uh, decoupling effort to some extent because uh, we can't anticipate when China will open. So we will shift to some extent to, for example, Indonesia. That's a great opportunity. But uh, China is too strong, for example, to, so, to get supply of uh, vitamin C's almost 100% from China. And can we build a new factory in Indonesia within a couple of years? It's almost impossible. It must. So, no, I mean, because uh, <laughs> economy scale, totally different. Because China can enjoy the domestic economy scale, which is really strong. So realistic, I'm, I live in business. Professor, you do international trade. How do you differentiate? How do you say that's a protectionist trade? That one is got to do with some kind of security issue. Well, the smart thing to do is just to avoid the rhetorical trap. Don't call it protectionism. Just uh, The right way to look at this is, does a measure discriminate against foreign firms compared to domestic firms? And that's the test we always use. And then if someone wants to give it the P word label, that's up to them, okay? And I think we've been around long enough to know that uh, uh, words like security have been used to mask discrimination against foreign firms. And, and that's, that's the bit which is worrying. I think one of the dangerous things is that we are now saying that we only trade with friends. Do we need to stop using these terms, friend or foe, and instead look at the numbers, see if it creates jobs, see if it actually makes life for ordinary people better? Friends or foe, who's cheaper, who's better? I buy from them, and that's 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 a fact of life. You know that's why that's why I don't know, you know there is some kind of phobia here, but at the end of the day, people company pick the cheapest, the best, and at today time it's the Chinese. You know, and it's a fact of life. But you know, uh, an aspiration for a country like mine, if they can do it, why can't I? And that's a destination also. So. Professor, do you think that that's the case? Do countries, when they do trade, actually take away that all the, all the rhetoric and only look at the numbers when they do the protectionism? I think countries, when they make policy decisions, look very much at their own national interests, for sure. Uh, I think the 
dynamic we're seeing of people talking about friends and foes is very dangerous. This is a recipe for fragmenting the world trading system. I know the national security hawks in various places are pushing this, but we, I, I think those of us who are interested in a system which is transparent, open, predictable, really need to stand up and say, wait a minute, how much prosperity are we going to sacrifice on the altar of some you know, illusionary promise of national security? If we look at RCEP, would you say that it is better to have it than not to have it? Yes, I do. I think um, it'll take time for the fruit to ripen on the tree, but it's, we've already got the blossoms there. It's coming. Tuck? Definitely. It'll be you know, better off for the member countries, and uh, we work together <laughs> to trust each other. Minister, you get the last word. I got just one. You know, this is the money where my mouth is. So that is the key. Where's the dough? You know, I, I, Indonesia has a saying, if you're not acquainted, there's no love. Now we got acquainted, I'm seeking for your love. <laughs> love is the profit. On that wonderful note, we need more love. <laughs> I hope very much that we can move forward to something that's more positive. And this lively, engaged panel and the wonderful audience around me actually reassures me that we can go forward to perhaps a bumpy 2022, but definitely a 2022 where we can keep our heads a little bit higher. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and thank you for being at the biggest trade deal in the world.